the point of uh, this evening is to provide more resources for you. Um, sometimes you read a book and you put it down and you pick up the next book, right? And other times you read a book and you run with it. You take every idea that, that they have and it changes your life. And I hope for some people in this room that we have some information that we provide today that puts you on a tangent that starts gaining traction for you and your family. I've been doing this long enough and talking to enough people now. I, I'm going to guess over, in the last year, over 500 people. And so I, I'm very blessed to have people that actually want to listen to what I have to say anymore. Uh, but I've been talking to enough people over the years to know that the people in this room are scrambling for answers, that they feel like uh, they're not getting the whole story, they don't feel like they're in control anymore, and they just want a little bit of hope. And the point of uh, putting resources in front of people is to show them that you can regain that control back again. And as Krista said, maybe I am a small piece or a big piece, or maybe I'm not part of the equation at all. But if you're leaving here with a little bit more hope that there's a little bit more or a lot more potential from somebody in your family, then I've done my job. So tonight we're going to be talking about a lot of different topics. We're going to be offering new perspectives. We're going to talk a little bit about some nerdy science stuff. And we're going to get into some specifics about what we do in our office. So um, that being said, I want to just do some quick uh, introductions here. Um, one, of the, one of the things I want to do first is just give a little background for me. And I don't want to step on any toes or spit on anybody here, so I'll keep moving back and forth here. Um, I'm a chiropractor. Uh, my name is Dr. Tony Mormon, and I am from this area. I'm from Glandorf originally. Um, at University of Finley graduate, then went on to get my doctorate at Palmer College of Chiropractic. Actually, my little brother just graduated from there two weeks ago. Uh, he's down in Columbus right now. I've done hundreds of extra hours in sports training, hundreds of extra hours in nutrition, and it feels like thousands of extra hours in pediatrics. And I can tell you in my past life, when I, when I was my brother's age, just graduating, I really thought sports chiropractic was what I wanted. I was in locker rooms all the time, in sidelines, working with athletes, and then, and then started working with kids, and more on that in a second. Proud board member at Awakening Minds Art. How many have heard of Awakening Minds? Very good, very good. We have a branch in Lipsick now at the Community Center. Um, as I said, part of the University of Finley uh, training staff there. Owner of Mormon Family Chiropractic, which I'm very proud to say is one of the largest uh, pediatric and family wellness practices in the state of Ohio now, in little old Ottawa. And if you've ever been in there before, and we have some people that are patients, if you come in there after school, it is crazy in there. It's just kids central. <laughs> And a proud member of the National Wellness Foundation, which I think the website's changed a little bit, but we'll get into that here in a little bit. The reason that's important is because many of you may have people, while you're listening tonight, that you're going to start thinking about that aren't from this area. Maybe a nephew or a cousin or a little brother that's in other areas. And the good news is, is there's hundreds of doctors and therapists that are trained in a similar way as, as what I've been trained in all over the country. So if you have interest in other areas there, and other interests in other areas of the world, and other areas of the country, you let us know and we'll plug them into this website here and see if we can find somebody a little bit more local for them. This right here is my why. This is my two nephews and my little niece. Um, I could say that pediatrics was a passion of mine before they came along, but um, when this little girl was born four and a half years ago, that changed everything for me. And I gotta say, like my purpose hit another gear, uh, specifically with how she was born and how she started out. Uh, and, the, and quite frankly, it's, it's funny how life works when your purpose grows, all of a sudden the business grew too. Like, Aubrey was born, and next thing I knew, this clinic was bigger than me, um, more than I could, more than I could take care of. And so, um, more on them in a little bit. But Aubrey is is my partner in crime. She would jump through fire to give me a hug. Um, my godson Gunner, 
uh, every time I asked him if he wants to play, he said, I said no. He <laughs> <laughs> turns around, so you can't, you can't have all, right? Yeah. yeah, I said no. Um, and little Hudson here, we don't know yet. He, he's got quite the personality for as young as he is, but I sure do love those, those three. Uh, so one of the big things uh, I just said was, was about Aubrey specifically. Now, Aubrey was born via C-section. It's a very tough delivery, um, and as far as we know, she had no outward symptoms, and um, she's been a healthy, thriving little Corvette engine of a brain kid, and this girl has a very fast brain speed, and I'm convinced uh, that uh, I would humbly say that we've helped prevent a lot of things uh, for, uh, for Aubrey because she is the definition of a kiddo that could fall into this little groove we're going to talk about today, this sensory uh, ADHD groove. And so when she was born, before she was born, I talked to my brother and my sister-in-law about how important a natural birth is, if at all possible. And if not, then it's very important to get her checked early on to make sure her nervous system stays full charged and organized. And so uh, my brother and sister-in-law were aware of that. They were agreeants to that. And after her difficult delivery, um, I had the pleasure of checking her when she was about 17 hours old. And uh, I kid you not, I could tip her head this far to the left, and she could not tip her head to the right. And she was only breastfeeding on one side. And so with a simple check, I, I realized very early that there was something wrong with her neck. And it wasn't that she was born with a deformity, it was because she had a trauma during the birth process. The irony there is she was very well taken care of in this <coughs> hospital, it's Christ Hospital in Cincinnati. And I timed it at one point, every 17 minutes somebody checked her. Every 17 minutes, the first 24 hours of her life, somebody was in there doing something, but nobody checked her neck. And then, so I came in there as a crazy uncle and, and very gently with my fingertip push, set her vertebrae back into place there and she started breastfeeding on both sides. She was able to tip her head side to side. The area around her brainstem was freed up and the brain could start talking to the body and the body to the brain. And I knew how powerful that was at that point, but just handed her back to my brother. And, uh, and he may never know what we prevented that day and he doesn't have to, thank God, because she's doing super well. Uh, Gunnar and Hudson were both checked within 24 hours of them, too. Dr. Nikki is back here. Dr. Nikki, can you raise your hand? Dr. Nikki is with us today. She is a chiropractor alongside with me, my partner in crime here. I like to tell everybody that Dr. Nikki um, is smarter than me, and all of this proves it, right? <laughs> <laughs> Graduated the top of her class. Um, she has a passion for kids um, to the point that she shows up early, she goes home late, and she worries. She worries about kids and families, and um, that means a lot to me, that she cares that much. And so we're lucky to have her. She will be around for uh, answering questions here as we go here, too. All right, so as I said, we're going to be giving some perspective here. We're going to talk about maybe looking at these kiddos and maybe a slightly different lens, so I'd ask you to keep an open mind here. First and foremost, should we just continue the way we're going right now? And statistically, I think everybody understands that we're going the wrong way. The fact that on a Thursday night in the back corner of a winery, we have a packed house talking about kids. Uh, should tell you all you need to know about where we're going and in in what direction. Sensory processing disorder, one in 20 kids. For teachers, that means there's at least one in every classroom that's dealing with that type of an issue. ADHD diagnosed one in nine kids. Autism's one in 59. Actually, I think statistically it's a little worse than that at this point. Um, and that climbing statistic is going the wrong way. And so... Um, one of the more telling statistics that I've read most recently is that one in four children have a diagnosable mental illness. That one hits me right between the eyes because I was a, a one of five kids. And so that means if we were born a generation later, the likelihood is one of us 
would have been raised with a mental illness, whether it's anxiety, focused attention issues, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, more likely than not, we would have been on medication early on in our life. We're about to show a video here, something of what we call an awareness test. Again, some of the information I'm gonna to give tonight is going to be something that you knew already. And oh yeah, I knew that, and that makes sense. But when we put it all together in a row, it kind of paints a picture here a little bit. So this is just a cool little video here to help set the tone for that. <clears throat> this is an awareness test. <clears throat> How many passes does the team in white make? The answer is 13. But did you see the moonwalking bear? <laughs> <laughs> I show that video almost every time I give a talk, and I do it for a reason. Um, sometimes it's right in front of us, right? Sometimes some of these things are right in front of us. And it, by the way, if you think tonight I'm going to tell you the one thing that is causing everything, you're wrong. I'm going to give a slow but sure accumulation of something that I feel this generation of kids is experiencing at an exponential level. It's not one thing, it's many, many, many things. And on the back side of that, I hope your expectation isn't that I have a magic wand or a magic bean that I have to sell you that's going to cure everything either. Uh, because I don't. As Krista said, uh, what we have is resources. What I hope you come out of this knowing is that we have energy towards and a love for helping kids and seeing more potential uh, out of them. And then <coughs> connecting people to the right people so you can see more of that potential. So at the end of this, what we have is not just resources and, and talking points, but we'll have an opportunity, if you'd like, to come into our office <coughs> and experience what, uh, what we do in our office as far as the chiropractic care. Uh, so again, no magic beans here, uh, but information for sure. I can tell you the most common question I get from other professionals is what I feel is the key to success when a parent walks into our office. Do I know whether or not their kid is going to be successful? And, and I'll tell you, no, I, I don't know that for sure, but I can also tell you that the likelihood of success goes up if the parents in front of me are leaning in and asking questions, specifically, what can I do? If I have a mom sitting across from me that's like Krista Lammers and has a lion heart and will do anything for Mitchell to see an ounce of more potential, you're going to be successful. And you might not be successful in the next 10 minutes, and you might not be successful this year, but if you have that kind of energy about trying to find answers, you're going to be successful. You just have to keep focused and don't let people tell you otherwise. In our office, we utilize technology. I like to say we don't guess, we test. So it's a lot like taking a blood pressure on somebody and saying, your particular blood pressure is 10 points higher than the normal. When we do the uh, exams here in our office, we're looking at normative data amongst their peers. So if it's a six-year-old boy, this data will represent um, what a normal value should be for a six-year-old boy. And so I'm going to show a few scans here throughout the evening, and I would like a baseline for you guys on what is normal. What normal is, is nice and symmetrical, no color, and a nice vase shape here. So skinny at the neck, more energy coming off of them around their core, and then getting skinny again as it goes down towards the tailbone. In this particular scan, they're actually measuring electricity coming off of the posture muscles here. 
What I have here now is an example of a patient in our office. Actually, this is Joyce's son. Uh, Joyce came to me very early in, in my process in, in trying to start a pediatric clinic. And at age three, Jace had bowel movement problems, acid reflux. He was on all these medications at three years old. Coughing while he was running, runny nose, watery eyes, croup attacks, each one worse than the next, and hospitalized a couple times. At three years old, Jace was living a miserable existence when he would exert himself. And so when you read that list, you would think respiratory issues, immune issues, digestive issues. And that's all true. But what I explained to Joyce when she came in the first time was that the nervous system controls all of those systems. And so if the nervous system is stressed out, disorganized, or dysfunctional, then it's only, it's almost inevitable that these other systems will struggle as well. And so we did a scan. You just saw what a normal scan looks like. And Jace was lit up like a Christmas tree. Every color existed there. And so my calm explanation to Joyce was, he may have some of these issues, but I know for sure he has a nervous system problem. We also know the steps it takes to get this nervous system back on track. And then let's see what happens when, when we get things back on track. So this is nine months later. You see this little before and the after. Take note of where there is persistent tension, by the way. You see that there's still some moderate to severe things happening there in the neck. But a lot of things clearing up around his respiratory and digestive areas. At this point, he's off all of his medications, not because I took him off his medications, but because his doctor did. Regular bowel movements, no more acid reflux, and no more coughing while running. If you ask Joyce later, is this the only thing she did, she would tell you no, because Joyce has a lion heart as well. Joyce is chomping at the bit, trying to find different things to help out her little boy, including changing uh, his diet dramatically uh, as well. So Jace is a thriving young man now at this point, uh, a swimmer of all things, uh, which I'm, I'm very proud of. So again, we don't guess, we test. If he had a nervous system problem, that needed to be addressed first, and it certainly leaves room for other things to help him out. So here's the plan. Gain better awareness. See the moonwalking bear when it's right in front of you, first and foremost. Just acknowledge that it's there. And that's something that we, we need to acknowledge a lot of times to be able to change. The second thing is to give answers. What I don't want to be is the don't do this doctor. Don't eat red dye and don't do video games and, and don't do this and don't do that. I want you to know that those things can really stress out your kids. But I also want to empower you so that they're more resilient. So that if they get that occasionally, that they can still thrive. And then give some specific action steps here as well. I hope to drop in a few references, some books and movies that I've watched and read that's led me along the path I've had. So what you have in front of you is a folder that hopefully is just packed with good information for you. There's places where you can take notes. And I've also included a sample scan in there because I know darn right well some of you are here, you're gonna soak this all in, you're gonna go home, and your husband or your wife's gonna say, so what'd you learn? And you're gonna talk about these crazy scans and you'll talk about some of the things you talked about and I'd like for that to be an easy process for you. So the folders are full of some, some good information. All right, you can help keep me on time here. Make sure I'm not falling behind telling the stories. Because <laughs> I've been known to do that. <laughs> Two rules when I was growing up. First was, don't call the kids names, right? Don't call, don't give names to kids. And yet, we're in this weird part of our culture where we just, we're almost addicted at labeling things, right? So he's walking and talking like this, so that must mean ADHD. And then you bring him to the next specialist, and they're like, no, nope, that's ADD. The other guy doesn't know what he's talking about. Nope, that's oppositional defiance disorder. Nope, that is autism spectrum. And the whole time the mom's like, who cares? Just tell me what do I need to do to help them out, right? 
Um, I also understand that sometimes those labels can open doors for you, can help out with the uh, educational system, and for nothing else, it can give you the right books to read to learn your son or daughter's mind a little bit better. But all this labeling is driving me nuts. And the other one is don't do drugs. Mm -hmm. Yet, so we have a society where we label the kids and then we give them a medication for whatever symptom that seems to be the obstacle. And yet we're not looking at root cause. I would say that a majority of specialists have a good heart, they have good intentions, uh, but if you were to ask them where is this coming from, a lot of them will struggle, as I would. Um, we can cover it up real quick with the medication, but I'd rather figure out why. I could take an aspirin every day if I had a headache every day, and it would go away, for me at least. But I'd rather figure out why I'm getting headaches every day, right? So we can cover this up or we can dig down and try and figure some stuff out for them. I'm about to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the sensory system here. So forgive me if I keep saying sensory processing disorder or just using the buzzword sensory if you're specifically listening for anxiety or ADHD. As I just said, I'm not really a fan of labeling your kiddo anyway. But I really believe that a lot of these are all just sensory type issues that are expressed in different ways depending on how the kiddo's doing. <clears throat> so when I say sensory, think more nervous system. When I gave this talk a couple years ago, I said, you might be sensory if this, you might be sensory if that. And it sounded a lot like a Jeff Foxworthy, uh, <laughs> you might be a redneck if. Yeah. <laughs> Raise your hand if you sell that stand up there, right? <laughs> So, here's a little ditty there. So, uh, you might be a little sensory if someone shaking their knee beside you or clicking their pen while working is driving you nuts. You might be a little sensory if you get car sick often. How many does that apply to? You might be a little sensory if walking into church, Walmart, or a stadium feels overwhelming or you get a little lightheaded. This, this is one that's, uh, that hits me. So I'm, I'm a little bit sensory, it's why I wear a bifocal, I have a visual sensory issue. There was a time I walked into Wrig Wrigley Field once and I got peaked white and felt like I was gonna pass out because of the, I was overwhelmed by the people, the noise, and the smells. Um, that happens a lot when you're having some of those issues. You're abnormally ticklish. There's a lot of times that being sensory, having sensory, do you mind grabbing that door when she, when she needs up? Thank you for helping. That, that abnormal ticklish, like not just uh, giggle, giggle, but you can't stand it, I might pee my pants ticklish. <laughs> There's some sensory going on there. You might be a little sensory if reading gives you headaches, makes you irritable, or reading is just flat out not enjoyable. And you might be a little sensory if the way your coworker is smacking their lips and talking with their mouth full makes you want to plot their death. <laughs> Just kidding. But maybe not, right? I mean, how many of us really get irritable with little things like clicking the pens and smacking the lips and, um, and, and those types of things? We know it's not reasonable, right? But it can't help but feel this visceral reaction. I give these examples for a couple reasons. One, just to let us all know that we all have a little something going on here, okay? We all have these powerful yet sensitive nervous systems. When I say nervous system, I mean the brain, spinal cord, and all the nerves going to and fro, back and forth. That whole system is involved here. Too often with ADHD or anxiety or even sensory, we talk about just the brain. The brains are off. Their chemistry is off. Their neurons are off. And what I hope to uh, demonstrate here is it's more than just the brain. The brain's only one part of the nervous system here. And again, we all have these little sensory tendencies. I learned this most clearly for the first time when I was at a sensory symposium in Philadelphia. So I wanna share this story about me personally because it, it gained me some empathy for the kids that, and what they're struggling with. And that's a, another message I hope everybody that listens to me talk uh, gets. So I was at this talk and the doctor on stage was demonstrating different ways to analyze uh, those kiddos that are dealing with sensory challenges. And one of them was 
uh, analyzing specifically for visual sensory issues. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, me not knowing I have sensory issues, the universe had her call me up on stage mm -hmm. in front of all these doctors and therapists. And uh, she was doing some, some basic checks. So she had this little pencil and she was waving the pencil in front of me and going back and forth and having me stare at the eraser. And then she had me stare at a penny and then she had a string with beads on them and I had to watch the beads moving side to side, naming off colors. And I gotta tell you, that was the most irritable I've ever been in public in my life. I was feeling myself getting mad at her. <laughs> and I also knew it wasn't logical. Right, but I could. You can't help what you feel, and so she, uh, in the middle of it, stops and says, um, "Are you okay?" And I said, "No, I'm not." <laughs> so she gets a chair and has me sit down. And by this time, I'm peaked white. And she asked, uh, she puts a microphone in front of me and says, "Please tell the audience what you're feeling and how you're feeling it." And I said, "I feel like I'm going to puke." So that's awesome. <laughs> uh, I feel very mad at you right now and I know that's not rational and I feel very lightheaded and she said that's because you have a sensory issue that's because you failed every test I just tried to give you and your depth perceptions off and your your ability to track my pencil was off and you're not using both of your eyes at the same time and you need somebody to help you out with some bifocal lenses and possibly some vision therapy and so that was a lesson to me that what I was expressing out, this anger, this confusion, this lightheadedness, was a direct result of input coming into my brain. So the problem wasn't that I was angry, it was that I wasn't able to process that information. Does that make sense? It was an input problem, not an output problem. So if I would have walked into my doctor and said, hey, I got this thing, I was on stage, I got angry, and I got lightheaded. And he could say, well, the medication for lightheadedness is this, and that anger issue will have fixed in a couple days. It was never about the anger, and it was never about the lightheadedness. It was all about the input coming in being <coughs> obnoxious to me. It was obnoxious. And as soon as you could acknowledge that and address it, you could solve it. So what is sensory processing disorder and what does it look like? You know, basically sensory, pro you could read this and I could read it to you, but I'm not going to insult your intelligence. Sensory processing disorder is an issue with the senses. And so it's not as extreme as when you're blind or you can't hear, you can't smell. But it's a disorganization of those senses. So our balance is off. Um, we hear things way too loud or way too quiet. Our taste buds are either too dull or too sharp. Sometimes the kiddos will uh, ask for extra hot sauce or they'll notice the little pepper that snuck into your dish, right? Other times it's this touch. There are some kids that have sensory processing disorder that you just can't hurt them. I mean, I've been, in, I've been in the presence of kiddos that have fallen and smacked concrete and got up and acted like nothing happened. Because they just, they don't hurt. And others that the sock is on their foot wrong and it ruins their day. The sheets don't lay right when they're in bed. The tag on the back of their shirt is annoying to the point of being disruptive, like disruptive in the classroom annoying. And so we have two very ends of the spectrum there, right? We have the hypersensitive and the hyper dull. Both are an issue with sensory processing. And so what this is, is it's a miscommunication from our nerve endings to our brain. And so there is a constant check-in with your nervous system of your environment. So right now, my nervous system knows the ambient temperature is fairly calm. I'm not too cold, not too warm. This is probably a place that I should be comfortable. There's no threat. Nothing that smells but good food and a little bit of wine coming from Sue's <laughs> glass there. Uh, my forehead's a little itchy. 
my nervous system's telling my brain all these signals all at once, whether I'm aware of it or not, and then my brain reacts to that and tells my body what to do. And at the end here, we're gonna find out that more and more of these kiddos are dealing with an input problem, not an output problem. And again, if, if you learn nothing else here tonight, if you focus too much on the output, if you focus too much on what they're expressing, you're gonna miss everything. You're gonna miss everything. What does it look like? A lot of times it looks like avoidance. So in my scenario with my vision, what it meant was avoiding eye contact, avoiding uh, looking at things that uh, are approaching or coming away because my depth perception was off. Uh, others will avoid activities altogether. So let's say your son or daughter has a smell sensory issue and your mom has a perfume that's obnoxious to him. He may not be avoiding your mom, he may be avoiding her perfume. He may not like this room because the fan underneath the lights give us a flicker that's obnoxious to him. And so uh, a little boy or a little girl that can't say, I don't like that, will just avoid it. So avoidance is one of the big things that you see. Terrible, terrible, terrible times with transitions. This is a big one. Uh, you tell them that... Uh, we're going to go to grandma's first, then we're going to go to church, and then we're going to go to Walmart. And you end up skipping grandma's and going right to church, and there's a meltdown, right? Um, you tell them we're going to school at 7.30, and there's a two-hour delay, and now we have to go to the babysitters, and there's a meltdown. Am I uh, speaking to anybody in the room right now? Right. <laughs> Transitions are a big, big deal. They want predictability because the world's a little bit more obnoxious, a little bit more scary. They excel at some subjects and then suddenly and unexplainably fail at others. So they can just be like the top of their class in certain subjects. You just know how brilliant they are. And yet in reading, they're just tanking things. Um, that differences in subjects can be the differences in the amount of obnoxiousness from their sensory system. They show signs of being a pleaser. I say this for this reason. Sometimes we look at these kiddos and we put them in the category of brat because uh, they have meltdowns, because they avoid, because they're not just falling in line like everybody else. And Sometimes kids are brats, right? We have brat tendencies. I have brat tendencies. But if we have a kiddo that is avoiding something but is also uh, remorseful about it, you know deep down what their intentions are. Uh, they, they want to please you, they just don't know how. They do great with reading, um, one read two, but or reading comprehension. We hear this all the time. This was some, something that I actually I uh, was very aware of in uh, junior high and high school. If I had a book on tape or something read to me, I got everything. I, I, I understood everything. If I was reading those lines because of my depth perception problem, the words were getting jumbled up and I wasn't retaining and comprehending things as well. And so there are a lot of kids that do really well if you read them their uh, spelling words, and then the next time you give them the spelling words to study on their own and they fail the test. The difference could be some sensory issues. Picky eater is one of the number one things that people talk about associated with some sensory type issues. I know I just spoke to like 90% of the room when I said that right now. Picky eating is a big, big deal. We did a whole talk about that earlier in the year. Picky eating can vary from he just doesn't like to eat his proteins and doesn't always finish his plate to he only eats chicken nuggets and macaroni and that's it. That's all he eats. Uh, those two things are his entire meal. And the problem with that is he probably only feels safe with those two foods. And, and that is... That's a tough reality because that means that the kiddo is living in a scary place with something as wholesome and nutritious as food. And so if we can open their world up a little bit, specifically with their eating, that changes everything for them. This will resonate with some people in the room too. Their brain speeds are usually off the charts. 
And that doesn't always mean they have the highest IQ, but it darn sure means that they have fast synapses. Most of the kids that walk into our office are very, very witty. And I love to match wits. Uh, they're very, very witty. We like to describe the phenomenon that they have with their brains as a Corvette engine with bicycle brakes. Corvette engine could fly down this road, right? But if you don't have the right brake systems, you're going to be in the ditch a lot. And so a Corvette engine is only as good as the, as the way to control that engine. And so I, I love this analogy because... You can, you can use this practically when you talk about maybe some of the specialists you've been to already. But you bring that particular vehicle into a shop and you ask them, what's wrong with my car? And they'd say, obviously, you have too much horsepower. We need to taper that thing down a little bit. You say, no, that doesn't sound right to my ear. I'm going to bring this vehicle to the next shop. You bring it into the next shop and they say, you lucky duck, you have a Corvette engine. You just need to be able to control that a little bit better. Here's some better brakes. I like to think that that's how we see the kids coming into our office. Not that they need to be slowed down, that they need more control. Better brakes for that Corvette engine. Fidgeting and overflow movements. So they, they tend to uh, need those fidget spinners or little toys to be able to occupy their brain. And they have a hard time maintaining eye contact. How many try to take a picture of your kid and they won't look at the camera. Or you have a family photo and they're all looking except him. Or all looking except her. Um, that is a very, very big, large signal that there's some sensory things going on. Parents report meltdowns at home, but the teachers don't always report it. So sometimes with the milder cases, the kiddos will hold it together all day. They still have this obnoxious stuff happening. They're holding it together all day. And then they get home, and it is meltdown after school. It's like, uh, it's like they were tortured all day, and now they have to get that off of their chest. That is a very common sign there. Understanding a little bit more about chiropractic, it's so much more than back pain and neck pain. We get associated with back pain and neck pain because I like to think we're pretty good at that. But really, we're not bone doctors. We're nervous system doctors. We're nerve doctors. We always have been. It's always been an assessment on the nervous system. And so the nervous system's function is to perceive the environment. Like I said before, my nervous system's telling me what kind of an environment I'm in in this particular room. And then it coordinates the behavior of all the cells in the body. And so as I said, we have input going to the brain. The brain makes sense of it and then tells output what to do. What do we notice a lot of times with kiddos with sensory issues? They have perceived coordination problems, behavioral problems. I mean, you basically are describing the nervous system when you're describing the sensory system. This is another key one. It's a key concept here for tonight. So with our nervous system, we have this um, subconscious innate ability to go from setting to setting inside our nervous system. One particular setting is the fight or flight system. It's our sympathetic system. This is the there's a wolf outside the door system. You better run or fight. You better do something. You find that your heart rate goes up. This is uh, the analogy you often hear where a mom pulls a car off their kiddo, right? They found these superhuman hormonal type things that happen because they're in fight or flight mode. Then the contrast to that, the opposite side of that, is the rest and digest system. It's the parasympathetic. This is where our food gets digested. It's where sleep happens. It's where calm happens. It's where we're supposed to be a majority of the time. We actually should be living in this rest and digest all the time. And then only when faced with confrontation do we get into fight or flight. So fight or flight is a normal response. We all need it for our survival. It's just not normal to be living in there. And I believe that most of the kids that come into our office are dominant with their fight or flight system. It's as if their nervous system has been trained to live there all the time, and then they only show us moments of rest and digest. It's the complete opposite of what it ought to be. 
Now, any of us can be in fight or flight by the time we get home. The example would be this. Let's say you're leaving here and you stub your toe on that door. Say a few cuss words under your breath. You get into your vehicle and you get a text message that the house is on fire. And so you're, oh my gosh, now you're buzzing down the road and you get pulled over. You get to your house and all your belongings are gone. Your family's safe, thank God. But are you in a mode at that point to go have dinner with your husband? No. Are you going to go to bed within the next half hour, hour? No. So you can't be in fight or flight and rest and digest at the same time. You're in one or the other. And too often, the kiddos will express this by either showing you that they're in fight or flight or showing you that they're not in rest and digest. Does that make sense? So they could, they could show you by they just won't go to bed or they stay up late and get up early. They could show you that they're not in rest and digest because they're constipated all the time or their belly hurts all the time or they are having reflux or other types of digestive issues. Those are less obvious. The more obvious that they're in fight or flight is they're bouncing off the walls all the time. They're impulsively speaking or acting. Their brains are so wired that they're not even hardly blinking. And they really aren't even plugged into the conversation or the world that you're living in. It's as if you're talking with your husband and your two kids and little Johnny's not in your world. He's like in his own little area all the time. He's unplugged because he's always in that fight or flight mode. And so we all toggle back and forth but again, I believe that kids are just conditioned now to be in this fight or flight all the time. And we're going to give some broad examples of why I believe that is. Here's another statistic that I did not give uh, at the beginning here. We talk about 1 in 49 or 1 in 64 or 1 in 20 in our society with different mental types of things. And yet in the Amish community, their autism rates are 1 in 2,500. So, you can pick that apart a couple different ways, and I'm not here to have everybody leave and just be Amish, right? <laughs> because I like my smartphone, and I like my truck, and I like electricity. Uh, but what I, I say that to say, there's a lesson there, in that the more stuff, the more uh, stressors that are in our lives, the more we are pushed into that fight or flight system. And I just believe with a simpler lifestyle that we get to exist in more of that rest and digest. <coughs> and so we can find that in our own way, in our own lifestyles. And I don't want anybody to leave here overwhelmed that they have to eat clean and be just perfect all the time. But just to see the moonwalking bear first and foremost, and then start controlling what you can control. And we're going to break that down here. Half hour, okay. So there, we say there's four different types of stressors. Here's the first one, physical stress. Now, a lot of times parents will come in and say, my kid has been through no physical stress, and others will say he fell down the steps twice, he broke his arm, he's always fallen off the back of the couch. Uh, those are some obvious ones, right? Uh, but I pointed out at the very beginning uh, something called uh, birth trauma. So one of the big things that we see in our <coughs> office is that when we interview the mom, we find that 80 to 90% of the time, the kiddos in our office were not born naturally, or they were born with some sort of force with their neck. So either cesarean section, <coughs> vacuum, forceps, or in utero constraint, head turned, cord around the neck, something where the neck was strained very early on. Childhood falls, but we also have something physical stress-wise that exists in babies a lot. It, we call that bucket baby syndrome. Now, this child needs to be in the carrier because you're out and about. But I guarantee that your son or daughter is moving around on the floor and on a blanket a lot. And yet, we have a uh, society where parents are always on the go. So they go from the carrier to a baby Bjorn to a car seat back to a carrier, these babies are not left to feel and, and 
get to know their world and therefore their nervous systems don't get to explore their world in a very pivotal time for sensory development. And so I give that example of the birth strain because their sensory systems are supposed to be sharpening in the first three to four years of their life. And if in the first three or four years they're experiencing insults to that sensory system, then they're falling behind on their milestones. I think the biggest tragedy with neurologic milestones is they're so hidden. If your son or daughter wasn't walking or talking at an appropriate time, wasn't cutting their teeth at an appropriate time, you would, uh, you'd be alarmed because they're not hitting their milestones. And yet, occupational therapists will tell you in the sensory world, there are lots of kids that are five, six, seven, eight <coughs> years old that aren't hitting milestones they should have when they were two, three, and four. And those neurological milestones are super important, mainly because of some of this physical stress. Chemical stress. You want to talk about a controversial slide, this is it. I could talk for a day about chemical stressors. And we'll break down some individual things here, but here is the general concept. I believe we all have a bucket, uh, this hypothetical bucket that can hold so much chemicals. And neurologically, that bucket can be filled a little bit with sugar, and it can be filled a little bit with pesticides. It can be filled a little bit with household cleaners. Krista said she was cleaning up her house because she wanted chemicals out of her house. Filled up with all the medications, all the vaccinations, all the pollutants. And each one of these individual areas we can show and tell that a child's able to tolerate um, downy and fabric softener. And a, and a child's able to tolerate red dye. There's nothing wrong with that. But if all those things are adding up and filling this bucket, and all those things are at an exponential level higher than what they were a generation before, and certainly higher than they were two or three generations before, then we can't help but call it the moonwalking bear. <clears throat> Vaccinations specifically, to me, are one of those things that is higher and more prevalent than it was ever before, and by design, they are to challenge our immune system for our immune system to grow. And the problem is, is that we, we put that in combination with all these other chemical stressors and we see time and again neurological stressful outcomes. And so uh, my mom had five vaccinations, I had like 13, my little brother had like 25, and my niece is scheduled for 50 some. You know, at some point, I don't care who you are in this room, it's, there is a number that makes you raise your eyebrows, okay? So, I, and I'm not telling you not to vaccinate. What I'm saying is there's a number that will make you raise your eyebrows. And so, uh, with my research, I found that spreading them out, at the very least, is, is one of the better things to do for their nervous systems and not having them uh, be bombarded chemically by any one of these things. Here's another big one. A big one that unfortunately a lot of pediatricians will roll their eyes to is that food sensitivities are real. And just because some kids uh, don't have allergic reactions to dairy or don't have allergic reactions to red dye doesn't mean that they're not sensitive to them. It doesn't mean that they're not neurologically sensitive to them. One of the most profound things that brought this to light for me was a pharmacist that brought in her son and this kiddo was literally bouncing around the room and she's holding him and chasing him and telling me how she found him on top of the refrigerator this morning. Oh. Like absolutely <laughs> running around the room. Unfortunately, they had a circumstance where they couldn't come back for the report of findings until two weeks later. She came back two weeks later. I've never adjusted this, her son at all. And he was sitting peacefully next to her. And I asked what the difference was. And she said, we figured out that he has a sensitivity to red dye. And we just took it out of his, we took it out of his diet. And now he, he does this, right? And so is there blood work for red dye? There's not, right? And you can't, you can't prove that, but all you need to do is ask that mom whether she believes it, right? And so 
those food sensitivities and those stories I get to hear time and time again, day after day after day. Uh, Joyce in particular had that very example with Jace. Gluten happens to be his kryptonite. If he is around gluten, he will surely be croupy. Um, and if he's avoiding that in his diet, he can thrive. He shows his potential. His nervous system is allowed to be free. Those food sensitivities are real. And I like to give these talks to teachers and grandparents too because usually they're the ones that need the most convincing. Uh, but it's true. Uh, but I tell you what, if, if it just gives you 10% more ease in your household, any one of us would change that diet. Mental and emotional stress. This applies mainly to babies and school age and above kiddos. The time in between, there isn't as much of the emotional stress. But I'll tell you this. Um, there was a little girl that was in our office where her scans were just not getting better. And I was working hard. And the parents were changing up all their food. And six, seven, eight months of continuous care and not having a breakthrough was very frustrating for me and certainly very frustrating for the parents. They were talking specifically about how she had issues with her grades, with focus and attention. And when we figured out that her biggest thing was an emotional stress, because biological dad was making promises he wasn't keeping, he wasn't showing up at birthdays, he wasn't supporting in a role that he should have been, and she was taking that on as a young girl. And as soon as we got her to a counselor where she could express that and get that off her chest, her grades went up and her scans got better. That emotional stress can drive things just as much as red dye can drive things. But emotional stress is a biggie. And so I, I, what I feel like I'm doing is telling these little stories about how I, how I believed it, how I owned it. I owned it by living it with these parents and getting to watch these breakthroughs. Um, the other thing is when a mom is pregnant with, the, with this baby, her nervous system is the baby's nervous system. And so they've done studies where they've actually, during an ultrasound, would have dads come in and purposely make the moms angry. Because dads know how to do that. Just <laughs> <laughs> go in there and poke the right button. And so the dads come in, they say what they say, the moms get mad, and on the ultrasound they watch the babies arch their back. Like this. So the, the point of the exercise was to show that the mom's nervous system is the baby's nervous system. And if we're living in a fast-paced, stressed-out mama world, then you're really training these babies into this fight-or-flight dominance. And so that's no fault of yours, but that is the society that we're living in right now. In fact, back in medieval times, they would say that they knew that if they stressed out the young m women of the tribe, that they would birth more warriors than farmers. And I believe that we have a whole society of warriors being told to sit still in a classroom right now. That's why I think we're at. And so I, I say this to say, it starts before they're eight. It starts before they're five and a half going to school for the first time. Very often it starts when they're babies. And, and it can be something that happens even before birth, certainly after. Here's another one. Electronic stress is huge. We'll go back to the Amish thing, right? How many tablets and phones are they looking at during the day? They're reading books, right? They're not on a computer in their classroom. They're certainly not on a TV when they get home. Now, I know that we're in a society where those screens are going to happen irregardless. But screen time has been shown to stimulate the part of the brain that's already overreacted when we're dealing with fight or flight dominance. And so if they're already in fight or flight mode and they're pulling in this blue light that stimulates that fight or flight mode more, then you're adding another stressor to their neurological system. And so we control that when we can, right? What's the opposite of sitting in front of a screen when they're home? Went out and playing, right? Get them outside, get them playing with toys. One rule that we have in our office is no electronic toys. We have these little Melissa and Doug toys. They're all wood, they're Legos, 
Uh, those kids come in and they gravitate towards those toys. Like they don't have them anywhere else almost. They're eating a banana, an orange, or an apple, and they're playing with an old wooden toy. You'd think we're in the 1920s when you're looking in our office here. But they love it. One of my favorite things is seeing a banana peel on the side of the road when I'm driving home. Because <laughs> I know it came from my office. <laughs> it'll, it'll disintegrate. It'll, it's not literary. So the point here with those stressors is this. It's, you can look at all of them and get overwhelmed. Don't do that. Look at the ones that you can control the easiest first. If you can take an hour of electronics away from them this week, then do it. If you can sure up their diet or look for food sensitivities, then try it. If we can find a way to have our house be less chemical dependent, cleaning up our perfumes, our cleaners, our detergents, then do it. Find ways and find things that can help decrease this toxic load, this stress load on them. Here's the new normal. Here's what we see in our office all the time. One of the big things that we do in our office is we interview the mom for 30 minutes. We'll interview her about how did the pregnancy go? How was the delivery? What types of milestones did they hit or not hit? How did things go immune system-wise, digestive system-wise, et cetera, et cetera. Here are the things that we see most often. We see a stressful pregnancy, some form of a difficult delivery, as I described before. And you don't have to have all these checked off to, to be able to come into our office. A lot of times the babies will express it with either colic, difficulties nursing, or the number one thing that we read and hear in the history is repeat ear infections. Ear infection after ear infection after ear infection. And one of the main reasons we find is that there's some interference or inability to move the neck in the right direction to be able to drain those ears. And the more stagnant that liquid is in their ears, the more likely for bacterial and viral infections. So repeat ear infections is the number one thing we see. We see a history, therefore, of lots of antibiotics, full schedule of the vaccinations, a lot of crazy food, a lot of environmental stressors, and darn sure a lot of technology and then we get this right and so um, I don't want anybody to read this list or hear the things that I'm saying and start thinking why did I or why couldn't I have that's not the right questions right now what I hope you're hearing is that there is something that's happening to our nervous systems and to our children's nervous systems that's pushing them into a corner neurologically. The reason that's empowering is because if we instead choose a different path, their ability to come out of that corner and start blossoming out of that shell can happen. And with that comes hope. So please hear that the right way. There is hope when you're reversing it. There is hope when you're taking weight off of their shoulders. And there certainly can be a, a way to pull you out of that rut. Nerve interference is something at bare minimum that should be checked in these children. What we find is that most of the time when the stressors are applied at such a great level, the fuses start to pop in their nervous system. And that happens with what we call a subluxation. And basically what that means is the fuse pops, there's a misalignment, and it's jammed. It's not moving like it should. Back in the day, we used to call that a kink in your neck, or a stitch in your side, or my back is out, right? That misalignment can certainly give us pain, but that's not all it does. It also disrupts that sensory system. And so most of the kids that come into our office have no pain. They're not hunched over like this, and they're not tipped to the side like that. But yet, when we're feeling their spines, we find several areas that are misaligned. And when we free those areas up, we're able to address the effects of these stressors. And so we just talked about physical, chemical, emotional stress. And then neurologically, we get these five things. We get a nervous system that starts to disorganize. And we're going to break this down very quickly here. The in-between is the fuse that pops in their spine. And so what I said earlier, actually at the beginning, I said that we're in a society 
or the fuse is popping all the time because there's all these stressors. And I also said, I don't want to be the don't do this doctor, right? And so the beautiful thing is God gave us this ability to reorganize the nervous system. And so we got a way to buffer that. We got a way to help reorganize even when life throws us a little extra stressor. We're going to skip that soon in the interest of time here. The effects are the five Ds. So I'm going to get nerdy for about two minutes and then we'll be done, okay? We'll be done with the nerdy part. Mm. What happens is the stress gets applied to our bodies. Our nervous system is sensing this. And then suddenly we get dyskinesia. We get the fuse to pop. That's when we have the kink in our neck, the stitch in our side. What happens after that is the information, disaffrontation, starts to go to the brain in an abnormal way. So we have a pinch on a nerve, and instead of that nerve giving full signal to the brain, it's giving irregular or abnormal signals to the brain. Now the brain, dysautonomia, the brain hears those abnormal signals, and says, young man, you're in a room that is chaotic and stressful because that's the messages I'm getting to the brain here. So therefore, I will tell you, act abnormal and stressful. And so if the brain hears all day that you are in the middle of a war zone, the brain's gonna say, well, if you're in the middle of a war zone, you better act like it, right? And so the reality is, is the child is in a classroom where they should be protected. And yet this information is getting misread to the brain and then certainly being outputted in the wrong way. And the last D here is the bad one. This unfortunately is the one we see most often in autism towards the severe end where they're disconnecting. This is where they are living in their own world. They're not living in ours anymore. They stop making eye contact. They stop engaging us like we'd like them to, and that disconnection is a sign that there's a lot of fuses being blown there and that they're really struggling. And so they, more than the rest, deserve as much all-hands-on-deck support as they can for their nervous system. Again, if nothing else, I'd like for you guys to take home this idea that this is an input problem, not an output problem. If you hear nothing else, hear, hear that particular statement. Maybe they're not choosing their behavior. Maybe they're reacting. Think back to what I just told you about with my particular time on stage with my visual issues. She was moving that pencil side to side and to and fro. I wasn't choosing to feel angry. I wasn't choosing to feel nauseous. And I wasn't choosing to feel like I was about to puke. I was reacting to something. And so if we get lost in looking at the symptoms, if we get lost at looking at the output, we're not able to help the kids the way we're supposed to. Instead, we need to look for patterns. We need to look for stressors. What could be those stressors that is popping the fuse and therefore giving them this output problem? By getting them checked and getting the nervous system checked, we can help buffer that and reorganize that. But at the end of the day, you're going to get a lot of questions from us at trying to figure out patterns. So we can figure out which of those stressors could be pushing the envelope. So this is a different way of showing those scans. The black is this particular patient. Again, we want to see a nice vase shape, skinny up here, bulbing out in the middle, and then getting skinny again down lower. This particular patient was very high energy, <clears throat> impulsive, and having behavioral issues. We don't label the kiddo, we label the scan. So when Nikki and I are back there talking, when we're going over your scans, this one is very cool, very clear what we call a raging bull. A raging bull is just that. They are high energy, bouncing off the walls, and, and, and not very uh, able to control, or certainly not calm. You can see the befores and afters here. You don't have to look at scans your whole life to see that there's a difference between this one and that one. Can you see that key neck area and how much uh, tension was there early on? That's one of the highest sensory areas in our entire body around the brainstem area. And now I watch how calm things are here following those adjustments. 
the second label, not on the child, not on the child, but on those scans, is something called a drunken bull. Drunken bull is very disorganized. This is very classic sensory. Whereas raging bull is more of our ADHD kiddos and anxiety kiddos, the drunken bull is much more the sensory kiddos in coordination, a lot of trouble, troubles with transitions, problems with specific things, specific subjects. You can see how disorganized things are. It's like a sawtooth here, back and forth. And then again, after getting adjusted and measuring things, we see things returning back to the base shape there. So the beautiful thing is this, that our bodies have this innate intelligence. Our bodies know what to do if we cut our hand. Over hours and days, that cut will heal and we never have to tell it what to do. There's an intelligence in us that knows what to do. When a body stops knowing what to do, it's because there's interference somewhere. And the beautiful thing about these scans is not that we're doing anything magical, we're just taking away interference and the body figures out what it's supposed to do like it was always supposed to do. There is no magic to it. The body already has the magic within it. The worst one for us is the combination of the two. It's the raging drunken bull. It's a disorganized and blown out everywhere. And that can vary. It can vary from expression to expression. You might say, my child is, uh, has trouble with attention and focus. And the next person could say, my child is high anxiety and avoids being in public. And we look at the scans and they look the same. Again, to me, it's not about the label. It really isn't about the symptoms. It's about whether or not their nervous systems are calm and they have every chance they can to be living with the most potential. So what I have then is an opportunity First and foremost, Nikki, you'll stick around for a little bit, right? So we'll answer questions at the end of this. What we have is an opportunity to come into our office if this is something that is resonating with you. So if you know that your son or daughter is the raging bull, has trouble with transitions, had all the ear infections, has uh, problems with uh, transitions between subjects, you yourself have anxiety. Maybe you lived in fight or flight for too long. You had a nephew, a cousin, a neighbor. What we have is an opportunity to get scanned in our office. So $75. $75 is the offer we give for these talks. If you're interested in getting your family in or one of your family members in, I want you to talk to either Sue or Becky or Joyce in the back. Can you guys wave back there? They'll be up here or out there. And what they've done is they set aside times to bring kids in and bring families in to get scanned. And so all I ask is that you're patient with the timing of that. Dr. Nikki and I are super busy right now. We're helping a lot of kids. And so Sue has a schedule out through February, beginning of February. And so that's because Dr. Nikki and I honor the people that have already asked for help and we won't sacrifice um, their time. And so we're working really hard with a lot of kids right now. There's a lot of opportunities to come into our office. Um, and so the first available may be in the morning or the afternoon or a Saturday morning. And so that will only be the first time you come into our office. From there, we have a lot of openings after school and after work and on the weekends to be able to help you out. So if that first appointment, you could help us out by finding a time that works for you, Sue and the rest of the girls will help you out. In your folders, there is specifically a little half sheet or full sheet that you could fill out that will help us in the scheduling of things. So you'll list people you'd like to bring into our office to get checked and an ideal time for you. So again, the offer is $75 per person to get scanned, evaluated. Dr. Nikki or I will do a phone interview with you and then sit down and go over a game plan. Here's the other thing. I always like to address expectations at the talk so that you know exactly what you're getting into. We're old school. We adjust with our hands. 
We don't have vitamins to sell you. We don't have specific strategies other than here's what's stressing out their nervous system and here's how we adjust them. We're gentle, we're specific. The frequency, that's a heavy question in our office, is anywhere between two and three times a week depending on the scan. So I would say a majority of the kiddos that comes in our office is twice a week. And some of the more difficult cases are three times a week. We need that kind of frequency to be able to break the pattern and get the results that we continually get in our office. The average cost, first and foremost, is not covered by insurance. We're not covered by insurance because insurance companies, companies see chiropractors as back pain specialists. So they want to know why your four-year-old four has 20 visits to the chiropractor if he has no back pain. And so we're able to um, treat your children off of the insurance plan um, by, uh, by doing just that, being out of network. And so the average cost in our office per month is about 400 to 450 per child. And that is only when we're going through trying to calm down the nervous system. A majority of our parents that are coming in that have already enjoyed some success in our office are about $70 a month um, to have their children checked and, and kept up on. So you have to know that initially, two or three times a week, and about 400 to 450 on average for cost. So I feel the more transparent I am up front, the more barriers we're removing here so you know exactly what you're getting into there.